So in my talk, I'm going to go back to the dark side of financial innovation. So it's going to be one of those uh, Hollywood <coughs> movies that will, end, that will have an unhappy ending. So you might have noticed that since 1960s, there has been a rapid uh, proliferation of new financial assets, such as various types of futures, options, uh, and more exotic derivatives. Uh, by one count, there were about 1,200 different types of derivatives in 1994, and that number is likely to be even greater now. And the traditional view in finance suggests that these uh, assets are useful to facilitate risk sharing because they enable the market participants to share and diversify um, their risks. But this view doesn't take into account that market participants could also naturally disagree about how to value these assets. In fact, a different strand of the finance literature emphasized belief disagreements to explain various features of financial markets, most notably the large trading volume that we observe in these markets. Um, but if you allow market participants to disagree with one another, they also naturally start to speculate on their different views. And speculation is something that creates risks, which goes in the opposite direction of the traditional view. Let me give you an example of this tension between risk sharing and speculation using uh, uh, the recent subprime crisis, uh, uh, from the recent subprime crisis in the US. So in the recent episode, in the run up to the crisis, um, the <coughs> assets backed by subprime mortgages, the so-called subprime CDOs, became highly popular. And one role of these assets is to allocate the risks in the market. The safer tranches were supposed to be held by market participants who were looking for safety or liquidity, and the riskier tranches were supposed to be held by market participants, those institutions that could bear those risks at some price. But while these securities and their CDSs should have served a stabilizing role in theory, they became a major trigger of the crisis in practice when a fraction of large financial institutions realized losses on precisely these types of securities. And more interestingly, a different set of agents in the market actually made profits on very similar set of securities. The recent popular book by uh, Michael Lewis, The Big Short, describes in detail a number of market participants who took a short position on housing-related assets. But these observations then raise the following question. What becomes of the usual risk-sharing role of financial innovation when market participants use them, at least to some extent, to speculate on their different views? And that's the question that I address in this paper. I revisit the effect of financial innovation on portfolio risk when, when the traders have not just risk-sharing, but also speculation motives for trade. And I do it in an otherwise standard risk-sharing framework. Um, there are a number of traders with uh, mean variance uh, preferences, the usual mean variance preferences, and they have some background risks. And there are a number of financial assets which in principle can help them to get rid of some of those background risks or diversify them. And this captures the risk sharing motive for, for innovation. However, the new ingredient that I bring into this setting is that traders might also disagree about the payoffs <coughs> of assets in this economy. And that captures the speculation motive. And I model financial innovation as an expansion of the set of financial assets. So I started an incomplete set of financial assets, and I made that set bigger, and I call that financial innovation. And my goal is to do the comparative statics of financial innovation with respect to portfolio risks. So we need a measure of portfolio risks as well. Because traders have mean variance preferences, a natural measure is the variance of a trader's portfolio. And I take that, and I uh, average that across all traders, and it gives me a measure of average portfolio risks in this economy. And it turns out that in this economy, this measure actually naturally breaks down into two components. The first one is what I call uninsurable variance. And this is the lowest amount of average variance that we can get given the set of assets in this economy. So this is the best we can do given the financial technology. And it turns out that actually the equilibrium will get you there when traders have the same beliefs. However, in my setting with belief disagreements, there will be a residual component. And I call that residual the speculative variance because it is there only because of belief disagreements and the speculation generated by those disagreements. And my main result characterizes what happens to these two components with financial innovation. I show that new assets always reduce the uninsurable variance. So the best that we could do, the idealized benchmark, always becomes lower. However, they also always increase the speculative variance. And that's the new result. And in fact, the second effect, the increase in the speculative variance, could be sufficiently large that financial innovation can also increase the average variance, average portfolio risks in the economy. Now, I, my analysis also reveals that financial innovation increases the speculative variance through two channels. 
The first one is the motivation for the paper, and that's rather straightforward. So if you introduce a new asset, you generate a new bet, new betting opportunity. People might disagree on this asset, and they will tend to speculate on that, and that will increase the speculative variance. But there's a second and more subtle channel. It turns out that new assets will also amplify existing speculation. Even before you introduce this new asset, people were already speculating on existing assets. And it turns out that when they have a new asset, they will do more of that speculation on existing assets through a, an effect which I call the hedge more, bet more effect, and which I'm going to come back to later in the talk. But it's because of this channel, it turns out that even a new asset on which people completely agree, we agree about the payoff of this new asset, that asset will still increase speculation and speculative variance because it will amplify speculation on existing assets. Right. So uh, the result is because of that is quite general. It doesn't, we don't need to disagree per se on the new assets. And the result is also general in a different sense. Um, it takes the set of assets as exogenous and it applies no matter what those assets are and where they come from. But of course, an interesting question is where do they come from? The question of endogenous financial innovation. And there's a large literature on that and, and it emphasizes among other things risk sharing as a major driving factor behind endogenous financial innovation. But in view of the earlier result, there is also reason to be suspicious of that conclusion. So I also look at endogenous innovation in my setting. I do it by introducing a profit-seeking market maker, which chooses a set of assets among a larger set of possibilities, and then it, serves, uh, it becomes the intermediary in those assets. And naturally, the market maker's profit incentives are driven by not just the risk-sharing motive for trade, but also the speculation motive for trade. And that leads to two uh, results in two extreme cases. In the usual traditional benchmark, when traders have, have common beliefs, I show that actually the market maker introduces the set of assets that will minimize average portfolio risk among all possible choices. However, in the other extreme, when belief disagreements are very large, now market maker will also go to the other corner and it will introduce the set of assets that will actually maximize average portfolio risks among all possibilities. And intuitively, the market maker doesn't care why traders are trading. And when belief disagreements are large, speculation motive is very strong. And then the market maker introduces the assets that will enable the people to speculate most precisely on their different views. And as a byproduct, market maker will also end up <coughs> maximizing the average portfolio risk in this economy endogenously. Now, these are strong results, theoretically. And they also raise the question you might be asking to yourself, how large belief disagreements need to be to make these results empirically relevant? And I address this question by considering a calibration of the model in the context of uh, national income markets. Um, so these are assets whose payoffs are linked to the GDPs or GNPs of countries. And in principle, they could facilitate risk sharing by enabling the individuals in different countries to share their different business cycle risks. And these were proposed by Schiller and more recently analyzed uh, uh, by Athanasolis and Schiller. And what they do is they, this, they characterize the optimal design of these assets. And they also calibrate their model to data on G7 countries to, to calculate the welfare gains from the introduction of a couple of these assets. What I do is I take their model, their data, their calibration exactly, and I just inject belief disagreements and the following, I do the following exercise. How large belief disagreements need to be to overturn their results about consumption risks? And I find that the answer is not large at all. Let's say this year, we think the US GDP growth will be 3%. But suppose there is also a dispersion. And suppose the interquartile range of our beliefs is about 0.07 percentage points. So it's, about two, it's between 2.96% versus 3.03%, versus let's say. That level of small dispersion is sufficient to ensure that the assets that are designed to facilitate risk sharing will end up increasing the consumption risks of individuals in G7 countries because individuals will use them to, uh, for more uh, to speculate than, than, than risk sharing. Now, what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is I'm going to use a simple example um, to illustrate the two channels um, by which financial innovation increases speculation. And then I'll show you the main result and finally end with discussion of the welfare implications of these results. So the economy has a single consumption good, which I'm going to refer to as a dollar. And there are two dates, 0 and 1. And there are a finite number of traders denoted by I. And they have some endowments at date 0. And importantly, they have also some random endowments at date 1, 
denoted by WI, and that captures their background risks. And they only consume at date one, so they can get their resources at date zero to date one in two ways. They can either invest in cash, which gives one dollar per dollar, and that just pins down the benchmark interest rate in this economy, normalized to zero. <coughs> and here are the important uh, feature of the model. There are also these risky financial assets denoted by J, and they are in fixed supply, normalized to zero. And they pay some random dollars at date, uh, at date one, and they're going to trade at a, a competitive market uh, at date zero. Uh, at a price P, P, J. And these are the assets that you may sort of map in your mind to derivatives or futures, which will in principle help the agents to diversify these background risks. But the important assumption that I'm going to make is that traders might also disagree about the payoffs of these assets. In particular, here's what the traders <coughs> in my model saw. They have mean variance preferences, so they like the mean of their net worth, and they dislike the variance of their net worth. However, they calculate the they calculate the mean of their net worth by using their own belief. And that's the important deviation from the usual wedge bar. It's the subscript i. And otherwise, the economy is completely st uh, standard. They optimize given their own beliefs, and the market's clear. Right? OK, so let me show you a simple example now to illustrate the, 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 how this economy works. And the example are going to actually, the example comes with a story. So this is the story of two currency traders that live in Switzerland. And uh, they have some exposures to the Swiss franc. So, and in fact, they have, they, they have a perfectly negatively correlated exposures. Trader one has a positive exposure to the franc. Trader two has a negative exposure. And I assume franc is affected by two sources of uncertainty. So V1, V2, you can think of V2, you can think of as things that happen in the Eurozone that might have affect the franc. And V1 is the things that happen in the Swiss economy that are orthogonal to the Eurozone that might also affect the franc. And the franc is a combination of these two risks. Okay. And uh, you know, if traders cannot trade, they just have these exposures which they cannot get rid of, so their net worth will be risky. Not an ideal situation. Let's now introduce a financial asset. In, in particular, let's introduce the Swiss franc futures. There's an asset that whose payoff is a Swiss equal to the Swiss franc. Now, what the traders are going to do, what the trader one is going to do is, she's going to take a short position in this asset. And by doing that, she's going to get rid of the exposure to the franc. And the other trade will take the opposite position, and she will also get rid of the exposure to the franc. So this, as, as, uh, this asset then will enable the traders to have constant net worth. Essentially, it enables them to get rid of their diversifiable background risks and reduces the risks in this economy. This is, in fact, uh, you know, how financial innovation should work in theory. This is the textbook model of financial innovation. But let's see what happens when we introduce belief disagreements. Suppose traders agree on the Eurozone risks. It's not clear how anyone could agree on anything that happens in the euro these days, but for the sake of the example, <laughs> suppose they do. But they disagree on the Swiss economy, OK? So that's important. And in particular, trader one is optimistic <coughs> about the Swiss economy risks, and trader two is pessimistic. And epsilon captures the level of the belief disagreements. And if you recalculate traders' uh, equilibrium portfolios and net worth now, you see trader one also still has a risk-sharing portfolio. There is still that force. But however, her, uh, her end for portfolio is distorted away from it by this second component, which I call the speculative portfolio. And you see this is increasing in her optimism. And this is intuitive. If trader is optimistic, she doesn't want to take a short position. She wants to say that distorts her towards a long position. And in fact, when she's sufficiently optimistic, she's actually going to take a net long position on the front, even though the sharing would require her to take a short position. And whenever that happens, you see, traders' net worth will actually be even riskier than the case when the asset was not available. So here, we have an example where there is an asset which, in principle, could get rid of all the risks in this economy, but ends up actually increasing the risks because people have large disagreements. And that's because the first channel, this new asset also generates, generates a new bet, and that tends to increase risk. But there is a second, let me just illustrate the second channel. Let's actually introduce a second asset to this economy. And that's going to be the euro futures. Remember, traders agree on the euro. So this asset, we agree on the payoff of this asset. But it turns out even this asset will increase portfolio risk. And to see that, let's consider the earlier case with only the Swiss franc. You see there was this alpha term in this uh, speculative component. Uh, and the reason there's this alpha term here is because traders disagree on the Swiss economy, but they can only bet on that through the Swiss franc. And that's only an impure bet, because the Swiss franc is affected by other sources of uncertainty that they don't disagree about. So they cannot take a few bets because they are risk averse. This impurity of the bet dampens this speculation. And so they don't take much of a speculative position. 
But if we actually go to Euro now, what the traders are going to do is they're going to take a bigger bet on the Swiss franc because now they can complement those positions with a short position on the Euro. They can actually get rid of these risks which they don't disagree about and take a purer bet on just the Swiss economy thanks to these cross trading positions. And because they can take a purer bet, they will also take a larger bet. Is, this is what I call the hedge more bet more effect and they'll end up with even greater risk. So financial innovation will further increase speculation by amplifying traders' bets on existing assets, okay? Now, uh, let me get to the general setup. The general setup is just like the example. There's going to be these Vs uh, that capture the uncertainty in this economy, but there's gonna be an arbitrary number of them now. And the net worth and asset payoffs will be linear combinations of these Vs. And the only assumption that I make about traders' beliefs is that um, they agree on the variance of these Vs but they uh, disagree on the means of the underlying uncertainty in this economy. This is just uh, for tractability. What matters for economic purposes is that traders disagree on how to value the assets. Whether that disagreement comes from the means or the variance is not that <coughs> important. But once we make this assumption, we're gonna be, we solve everything in closed form, the prices, allocations, and that's in the paper. Uh, my purpose, of course, is to do the comparative statics of that solution. Um, uh, with, respect to, uh, with respect to portfolio risks. And, and here is the measure of portfolio risk that I consider. Um, I take the variance of each trader's net worth and I average that across all the traders. And I, I, I weight this net worth uh, with the uh, risk aversion coefficients of the traders. And that's intuitive because some of the risk sharing in this economy is a transfer of risks from uh, high theta agents, high risk averse agents to low theta agents, and this weighting intuitively captures those benefits of risk sharing. It also turns out to be the natural weighting for my model um, for reasons I don't have the time to, to get into right now. But it turns out that once you have this measure, it turns out that when traders have common beliefs, they will actually, the equilibrium portfolio, among all possible portfolios you could have, will minimize this particular variance. Okay? The equilibrium will actually minimize the risks when traders have the same beliefs. So I define that minimum as the uninsurable variance, and then the residual I define this as a speculative variance, and as I already mentioned, my main result is this uh, financial innovation will always reduce the uninsurable variance. This is not very interesting, this is very straightforward, because remember, uninsurable is defined to be the minimum. So when you have more assets, the minimum can only go down. So this is uh, very straightforward, this is the new result. The speculative variance will also always go up. Okay? The residual will also always go up. And the intuition for that is actually also uh, easy. To understand the intuition, it's useful to go to an economy in which traders' only uh, trading motive is speculation. So suppose we keep the everything in the economy constant except we just shut down the background risks. So that traders are only trading for speculative reasons, for belief disagreements. It turns out that what's gonna happen to portfolio risks in this hypothetical economy will tell us what will happen to the speculative risks in the original economy. Okay? So we only need to show that financial innovation will increase the portfolio risk in this hypothetical economy. And it follows from a very simple um, uh, standard portfolio choice theory type analysis. Uh, because traders have mean variance preferences when they don't have background risk, standard portfolio theory tells us that uh, the standard deviation of their portfolio will depend on the sharp ratio of the optimal portfolio calculated with their own beliefs uh, divided by their relative risk aversion. And this is intuitive. When a trader identifies a trading opportunity that's more attractive as measured by their sharp ratio, she takes a bigger, posi bigger position, risky position on that portfolio. And in fact, she does it to such an extent that she also ends up with greater portfolio risk. Okay, it's just coming from the mean variance optimization. Now, from this, the lenses of this result, you can see my result now, that there are more assets, the sharp ratio, speculative sharp ratios increase for all traders. Why? Because they could do all the best that they could do before, but now they can do even more. So speculative sharp ratios go up. In fact, it goes up through the earlier two channels that we have discussed. Um, either there are new assets generate new bets, and that increases expected returns, perceived expected returns by trader, and that increases the numerator of the sharp ratio, roughly speaking. Or new assets enable traders to purify their bets, and that reduces the denominator of the sharp ratio, again, roughly speaking. So either way, sharp ratio goes up, and when the sharp ratio goes up, tra traders take bigger bets, and they end up with greater speculative risk. So, but this uh, result, this intuition also shows that actually traders' welfare, if you calculate with their own beliefs, actually increases, right? Because the reason they're taking these risks is because they perceive these high expected, they're going after high expected returns, that's why they're taking these risks. 
So uh, in, in other words, financial innovation generates a Pareto improvement in this economy. So should we be worried? Well, it turns out that this welfare conclusion can be overturned in two variants of this baseline setting. The first variant is just an interpretation of these disagreements as coming from um, distortions. <coughs> Uh, well, in a large and um, growing literature in behavioral finance suggests that people's beliefs might be distorted because of a variety of psychological biases. And if their beliefs are heterogeneously distorted, they will naturally come to have belief disagreements and speculate on one another. But if this is the source of belief disagreements, ideally you don't want to use the, uh, the people's own belief to calculate their welfare because the beliefs are wrong almost by definition. What you want to do is you want to use the objective or the non-distorted belief. But there's a practical problem because the planner might also not know this, this objectively. So there's a problem of whose belief should be used to do the welfare calculation. And in recent work with Marcus Brunner, Meyer, and Wei Xiong, we propose a solution to this practical problem. We say that if the planner doesn't know which belief to use, maybe she should use all of them. So we say that allocation is going to is belief neutral, inefficient. If it is inefficient, according to any trader's belief and anything in between, according to any convex combination of trader's beliefs. Now here's how this works in my model. If you take any belief, any convex combination of trader's belief, welfare in my model is straightforward because <coughs> of the mean variance setting. Uh, there are no wealth effects, so the social welfare is just some of the certainty equivalent networks of, of the traders. And if you calculate this for any given age, you see that the welfare has two components. The first one, is exogenous in the sense that it doesn't depend on traders' portfolios. So we can just, when we compare allocations, we can just ignore this. The second, and the part that depends on this endogenous, is actually the average portfolio risk, which I introduced earlier. So it turns out that whenever financial innovation increases um, portfolio risk, it will reduce welfare according to any belief, age. So it will actually be belief neutral and efficient. And the reason is, trading in this economy doesn't generate any aggregate net worth. It's an endowment economy, so trading these expected networks are pure transfers across agents. So trading affects the, um, the, the aggregate welfare only through uh, portfolio risk. So whenever trading increases uh, portfolio risk, it becomes inefficient, regardless of whose belief you use to do the calculation. So another way to say that is traders in this economy actually think they're going to do very well, but they also think everyone else is going to do very poorly. They think they're going to do well at the expense of others in this economy. So every trader actually recognizes that the speculative, uh, the, the financial innovation leads to a, a socially inefficient allocation. She just thinks she's going to be better off and everyone else is doing very well. <laughs> but there's a second and perhaps more uh, standard way of overturning the welfare conclusion. If traders' portfolio choices are associated with externalities, then you can, we can also uh, overturn the Pareto conclusion. Well, these externalities emerge naturally when these traders correspond to financial intermediaries. And these intermediaries might take socially excessive risks, uh, perhaps because of fire sale externalities, which has been emphasized in the recent literature, or perhaps <coughs> because they are under explicit or implicit government protection. And in fact, I do a, a slight variant of my model where these institutions are intermediaries are under government protection. And it turns out, that, and then that model, their, their risks are, are associated with externalities on the government. Because when they go bankrupt, the government has to come in and bail them up. And importantly, the cost of the bailout or the size of the negative externalities depend also on a measure of average portfolio risk. Not the same measure I showed you, but a measure of average portfolio risk. And that's because um, when, when, when an institution takes greater risk, she, she goes bankrupt more often and the government has to come in and save it more often. So again, you know, portfolio risk now measure the, the size of the externalities. And it could be that financial innovation might be inefficient in this model, even in the usual Pareto sense, uh, whenever these negative externalities exceed the perceived private benefits of these institutions from betting against one another. Uh, but what I want to emphasize is that the common element across the two uh, settings, the earlier distortions uh, case and the ex externalities case, is that in both settings, um, portfolio risks emerge as a natural component of the welfare analysis. So that gives some normative content to the earlier results. My earlier results were purely positive. They describe what happened to portfolio risk. But you see, under these interpretations, it will also have a normative content. But that said, let me, I don't push the normative implications. And, and, uh, and by no means, I don't make any policy recommendations in this paper because my analysis is missing a, a number of other factors by which financial innovation might affect welfare. 
So it could be, for example, that pu even pure speculation could be beneficial because it helps price discovery and makes prices more informative. I don't model those channels. So my results here should be viewed as the component of welfare that operates through wealth, uh, portfolio risks. And uh, you know, the net effect of financial innovation on welfare uh, should combine these effects with those other effects. And I leave that analysis for, for future research. So I want to just leave you with one, with one message. Uh, belief disagreements, um, uh, when we take into account them, when we, when we take them into account, are, um, could be powerful enough to overturn our usual, the way we usually think about financial innovation. In particular, they can make it such that new assets actually increase risk in the economy as opposed to decrease. And it could also be that the endogenous driving force behind some of these innovations could be uh, speculation as opposed to this fear. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>